Devotion is a 2019 video game by Taipei-based Red Candle Games. Most people know it for the brouhaha in its background art that got the game banned from the whole world. Leaving that aside, the game's story set in 1980s Taiwan is quite good. You can watch this great video analysis that goes deep into the plot. Spoiler alert. You should watch that video first, and I'm going to link to it in the description. Finishing the story, I was struck by the game's thoughtful and emotional reflection on mental health issues in Chinese and Chinese-influenced cultures. It has led me to think about such challenges of mental illness for Han Chinese people adjusting to this new modern world, and thus, this video. But before I want to uh, go forward, I want to start with a warning. I feel a little weird every time I have to write about something as slippery as culture. Everyone has had a different experience of a particular culture and how culture colors people's responses to their issues. I have friends, Taiwanese, Chinese, American and more, struggling with mental illness and all of their stories are unique. Whenever we make some generalization of a group of people, then you find a bunch of individuals for whom the generalization doesn't apply. That's a good thing, because we are deep, complex individuals, and I think we should be more than just a single throwaway line. But our brains are descended from bacterium, and aren't always quite equipped to fully comprehend the complexity of our world. So we need to boil things down and make generalizations, like what we are about to do today. I want to make that all this clear before we embark on this video. Chinese cultures of the type found in mainland China and Taiwan, and also influence the cultures of other countries like Korea, Vietnam, and Japan, can generally be described as having Confucian values. Han Chinese society also sees significant influence from Taoism and Buddhism, but we're going to set those aside for now. I don't want to get too far off track, but do know that there's other influences out there, and they do have their own perspectives on the mental health issue. But back to Confucianism. What is Confucianism? That is for another video, but I want to make clear that Confucianism isn't a religion like Catholicism or the like. Rather, it's a worldview, a philosophy of life, outcomes of what Confucianism quote-unquote thinks of a certain situation or a person's issues are variable and can be reinterpreted. The core tenet of Confucianism is that each member of society has to follow the moral demands that their role requires in relation to others. When you disregard your obligations, then that causes disharmony. This is a big no-no, as Confucianism very highly values the maintenance of social harmony, in some cases higher than that of the individual. Complying with those roles and actions help contribute to personal and social harmony. So for example, you have a job. Ideally, you go to your office as needed, do your work, and help your boss do their job. In return, your company, which includes your boss, is obligated to provide for you, do their job as well, and keep the company capable of providing a living for everyone. This work relationship is modeled on the basic father-son relationship common in Confucian patriarchal societies. You can extrapolate the family model to extend throughout an entire company. The company is the family, and its existence and survival takes precedence over the survival and existence of the individual. Chinese societies, mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore, among others, show explicit evidence of a mental health stigma. In one survey in mainland China, 60% of 1,491 responders reported feeling a stigma from having a schizophrenic family member. Another survey in Hong Kong found that nearly half of 320 schizophrenic outpatients were first laid off from their jobs and had family members treated unfairly because of their illness. Comparative studies of the ethnically Chinese people living in Asia and Western societies find that native Chinese are more likely to believe that mentally ill people are quote-unquote quick-tempered and quote, dangerous no matter what, end quote, that they might quote, lose control, end quote, and can commit quote, outrageous acts in public, end quote. These studies note Chinese people's strong emphasis on the idea of unpredictability. The fear that a mentally ill person suddenly doing something that no one else anticipates, 
flying off the handle, so to speak. Not to say that other cultures don't also have this fear as well, but saying that this is one theme that keeps recurring over and over again when studying people of this particular culture. Our fears reveal our values. For a Confucian society that values predictability, social harmony, and order, they fear the potential of mental illness to disrupt all that. The illness impairs a person's ability to fulfill their roles and duties. Thus, mental illness is seen as a problem of a person's weak character or spirit, a moral lapse or defect. Mental illness destabilizes the traditional Confucian relationships. The possibility that your child might be mentally ill, like what happens in devotion, shatters the filial relationship expected in Confucian systems. The father expects an outwardly perfect daughter. The daughter failed to provide that. The shame and guilt from that failure falls on both the child and the parent. Let's further dive into that. Like I said before, Chinese Confucian society values the harmony of the collective whole over the individual. It values the outward reputation of the family unit. Thus, the consequences of errant behavior from one individual family member are shared by the family at large. I mentioned shame and guilt earlier. Chinese traditions use those two feelings, shame and guilt, to enforce compliance to societal expectations and proper behavior. To weaken outsiders' confidence in our integrity and character, that is the meaning of losing face, or dudian. That's the feeling imposed on you when you can't live up to your duties and expectations. Chinese individuals with mental illness problems often see this rejection and stigma coming, if not explicitly, then instinctively. In Hong Kong, 70% of respondents agree that if knowledge of their mental health were to get out at their workplace, then they would be less likely to be promoted at work. Additionally, 60% of them are afraid that their significant other would break up with them. The realization means that the first and primary coping behavior to mental illness is secrecy. They hide their issues from their peers, family members, and co-workers. And then it becomes a double-sided conspiracy with equal participation from both the members of the relevant social circles as well as the patient. 59.6% of patients from the prior Hong Kong study said that their family members also want them to hide their mental illness from, quote, the outside world. This internalization and concealment can lead to self-esteem related issues and more further down the line, though this hasn't necessarily been confirmed by Western studies, but it makes instinctive sense. When secrecy and concealment no longer work as the first line of treatment, then patients tend to move to consultation with elders and after that traditional healers and shamans. This is the line of treatment that the father eventually follows to great tragedy in devotion. On a side note, there are a lot of theories about why families would turn to traditional healers rather than Western therapies. Many of them have to do with Eastern ideologies around the merging of body and soul taken to an unusual extreme. There's a lot more to say here, but we must move on, perhaps in a future video. In America and the West, the lack and decline of treatment options for the mentally ill is a serious issue. I used to live in San Francisco and it is hard to ignore how the mentally ill are left to their own devices on the street. This is a hard problem, one that many believe starts with a lack of funding, training, and empathy. But over in Asia, options have been even more limited for sufferers. For many years, Asian governments focused on economic growth and expansion at the expense of providing social services such as mental health care. It was a stated governing philosophy. 1996 Hong Kong, for example, spent just 2% of its budget on psychiatric health care as compared to the U.S. and the U.K. during similar time periods, 6% and 10% in 2002. Secrecy Guilt and shame all contribute to making it harder for mentally ill patients who recognize that they need help to get the help they need. While some of these funding trends are reversing somewhat, they far lag behind resources dedicated to mental health issues in Western societies. In Taiwan specifically, mental health literacy remains poor, like as with many other Chinese societies in greater China. And progress seems to be slow. 
Surveys of Taiwanese over time from 1990 to 2000 find an increase in people believing that people with mental illness should not be punished for their crimes. Those people are also more likely to support the idea of going to see a doctor for treatment. That's a good thing, and something I personally feel encouraged by. But on the other hand, there was a measured increase in people believing that, quote, insanity is hereditary, end quote, and that it is caused by, quote, offending the gods, devils, or the souls of the dead. One in four Taiwanese up until now still believe that you can and should treat mental illness by going to a temple rather than a therapist. This attitude is a little more disconcerting, and I'm afraid can lead to further discrimination and shame for sufferers and their families. These attitudes do seem to be influenced by the environment in which the person is living. A study of Taiwanese and Chinese immigrants to Australia found that being born in an Anglo-influenced society like Australia weakens the stigma. The strength of the stigma also seems to be affected by the person's age, opening the door to the idea that younger generations are becoming more comfortable to Western concepts of mental illness. We shall see. If you are interested in learning more about how modern millennial Taiwanese in particular see and treat mental illness, and if you can also speak Chinese, I highly recommend this podcast interview of a Taiwanese psychiatrist, which dives into these issues. I feel that you can learn a lot from their empathetic and thoughtful conversation. I know I left a lot out here. And I know I probably missed out on your personal experience with culture and mental illness, but I hope to illuminate a little bit, and hopefully this will help you more with a serious health issue going forward. Thanks. Take care of yourselves.